Good afternoon. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education for the National First Ladies Library, and I'm joining you on a dreary day here in Canton, Ohio, from the National First Ladies Historic Site, where we work with our partners at the National Park Service to curate exhibitions um, at the Education Center here and put on programs that help to promote um, the lives of the First Ladies of the United States. So I want to welcome you to our first program of the new year. We're so excited to have you here. Um, we are coming to you live on Zoom or on Facebook. Um, <clears throat> and I want to let you know that um, and tell you about a few upcoming programs um, before we get started. So our um, this year, if you have a New Year's resolution, uh, we likely have a program that is going to help you keep it from lectures that will help you learn to cooking to book discussions. Um, we've got a little bit of something for everyone. During the talk today, I'm going to post in the chat uh, some information so you can connect with us via Eventbrite and register for some of those upcoming programs. Our next legacy lecture next month will be on February 1st. We're going to be hosting Piper Hughley, who is the author of a brand new novel about uh, fashion designer Anne Lowe. You may have joined us for some previous talks related to Anne Lowe, the amazing African-American fashion designer, best known for designing Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress, but an amazing designer in her own right and a fascinating person. Should be a really great talk and discussion. Um, if you love books and reading, whether it's novels or nonfiction, we also have an upcoming Coming book club. We're reading a book about Alice Roosevelt for next month, February 27th. Um, we'll also have our film series start back up in February. Um, if you joined us before for a discussion of the cult film Grey Gardens with a great connection to the Kennedy Bouvier family, um, we will be discussing that summer. And we will be joined by Jerry Torrey. If you're familiar with the film, Jerry Torrey is the houseboy. Um, he's regarded as the marble fawn throughout the film. He's an amazing artist. He's written a book about his experience. There's a documentary just about him. We are really excited to have him join us. I think it's going to be really great. Um, we also have a curator talk coming up. We'll be talking about a work in our collection, a fan that was owned by Ida McKinley's sister, Mary Barber, and that will be on February 16th. So those are some of the upcoming programs that we have. Um, but today we have a really great legacy lecture to kick things off. Um, if you have questions for our speaker today, if you're having AV challenges, you can join us in the chat um, and ask questions. We have an amazing uh, crowd of people who have always helped me to troubleshoot myself through uh, some of our AV issues here on Zoom. Uh, so you can ask questions um, in the Q&A or in the chat. So today we are joined by Tilly Lasky. She is a museum curator specializing in native art and culture. She first encountered Evangeline Whipple and Rose Cleveland in 2004 while curating Bishop Whipple American Indian Collection at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Since then, Lasky has tracked Evangeline Whipple's footsteps across the United States and Italy, helping to inform the content of Precious and Adored, The Love Letters of Rose Cleveland and Evangeline Simpson Whipple, the book she co-authored with Lizzie Earnhardt in 2019, as well as other publications about the women. A native of Maine, Lasky received her bachelor's degree from the University of Maine and her MS in Museum Studies, Anthropology and Art History from the University of Colorado. She has curated at nationally recognized museums in Maine, Minnesota, and South Dakota, and currently works as the curator at Maine Historical Society in Portland. So I'm going to turn things over to Tilly and turn off my screen, but I'll be here in the chat if you have questions for Tilly, and we will meet up afterwards to discuss. Thank you and welcome, Tilly. Thank you, Allison. It's really um, such an honor to be here. 
and thank you to the National First Ladies Library for having me. Um, I am going to start sharing my screen and get right into this presentation. I'm going to stop sharing. Sorry about the um, little bit of issue. Okay. Can everybody see that? All right. Okay, great. Okay, so today I am joining you from the Wabanaki homeland in Brunswick, Maine, a place that my family has benefited from living um, for over 300 years, mainly because of the removal of Wabanaki people. And today I am honored to be here to tell you a love story about two strong and dedicated women two of my favorite people, Rose Cleveland and Evangeline Whipple. The book I co-authored with Lizzie Ehrenholt, Precious and Adored, contains an introductory essay that contextualizes their 28 years together and the 133 letters that Rose Cleveland wrote to Evangeline Whipple, which are transcribed, annotated, and reproduced in their entirety in the book. Because this is an informal presentation, I'm referring to them by their first names, and I'm also using a term that some people are uncomfortable with. Um, I'm using the term queer. And in the past, it's been considered derogatory, but a younger generation, including my co-author, Lizzie, have reclaimed that name, uh, that word. And so I am following their lead and using it. Okay, so there are currently three publications that are directly related to Rose and Evangeline's life together. And one is A Famous Corner of Tuscany, which I authored in 2013 through the University of Pisa, um, Precious and Adored, which we've already talked about in 2019. And something really excited, exciting happened in 2021. Um, the University of Pisa published a Italian translation of the work. So it's called Mia Preziosa e Adorata. All right, so now for some background. Rose Cleveland um, was born in 1846 and she lived until 1918. She was the youngest of nine children and was said to be the favorite of her eldest brother, Grover Cleveland. Rose was considered a blue stocking, which is a serious academic woman. Grover wasn't a fan of her employment activities. She worked as a teacher for much of her life and an editor. Um, and it said a newspaper report said that he had offered her $6,000 a year if she would cease working outside the home, which she did not. Grover Cleveland was single when he became president in 1885, so he appointed Rose as the official White House hostess, meaning she was responsible for first lady duties. Rose had served as hostess in the New York State House when Grover was governor, so her appointment to the White House made sense. Rose used her visibility in the White House to advance conversations about reform movements, such as women's suffrage and temperance. Society newspaper reports document Rose's women's visitors. Annie, Vec Vec Annie Van Vechten was a woman who stayed for months at a time at the White House, entertaining alongside Rose. Annie's visits were so frequent that rumors began that Van Vechten was supposed to have been a choice for Grover's future wife. Rose served for 14 months until Grover married Frances Folsom. Rose Cleveland's last efforts as official hostess were to arrange Grover and Francis's wedding. This is still the only presidential wedding to have taken place in the White House, 
And this is a Harper's Weekly rendition of the wedding and um, a view of what the Blue Room looked like in 1886. Upon her departure, of the White House, Rose said, it will greatly please me to be relieved from the duties of hostess, which I felt were imposed upon me and which have interfered with my pleasures and pursuits. In 1885, during her tenure as hostess, and perhaps because of it, Rose's book, George Eliot's Poetry, became a runaway bestseller. It was translated into Russian, Italian, French, and German. Reports speculated that she profited the equivalent of $2.8 million today from this one book. After leaving the White House, Rose took a position as editor of Literary Life magazine in Chicago. In 1887, she was teaching at Mrs. Sylvanius's Reed School for Girls in New York City. Rose's life was in syndicated newspapers across the nation. She really became quite famous during her um, tenure as uh, hostess for the White House. And one report in the Duluth, Minnesota Weekly Tribune reported that, quote, the president doesn't like it because Miss Rose Cleveland has decided to teach school and earn her own living. He advised against it, but she has a mind of her own and carried out her intention. It is said, it, it is to be hoped that the president won't cut her dead. Literary success allowed Rose, a single woman, to own and maintain the Cleveland family home known as the Weeds in Holland Patent, New York, seen here on the left, and to purchase a parcel of land and build a beach home in Naples, Florida in 1890. Evangeline Mars grew up on the outskirts of Boston. And although we haven't found a record of her birth, the census indicates she was born in 1856. However, Evangeline usually self-reported her birth year as 1862. And this is still a mystery to me, I don't know why. In 1882, Evangeline caused a stir in her hometown of Wayland when she married widower Michael Simpson a 73-year-old businessman, textile baron, and philanthropist who owned the Saxony Mills Company in Framingham. Simpson was 48 years older than Evangeline, but the marriage was reported to have been a happy one. Michael died just two years after their wedding, leaving Evangeline the equivalent of about $64 million today, including their recently finished mansion, South Park. She was just 26 years old. Evangeline was fiercely committed to her family and used her wealth to help support them. Her Irish immigrant father was a machinist, farmer, and sometimes ran a boarding house with his wife, Jane. Although they came from humble means, Evangeline's brother, William, changed his name to Kingsmail about the same time that Evangeline added Thurston as her second middle name, and Jane Nags Mars, the mother, started going by Jane Van Pullen Mars. The names reflect a supposed royal heritage that the family uncovered during genealogical research, which was something that was really popular in the Victorian era. Um, so on the left, you see the Mars family with King's Mill sporting a pith helmet on the right, and then a circa 1908 photo of King's Mill Mars and his wife, Laura, in Egypt, posing behind mummy and sphinx stand-ins. And so the Mars were friends with Egyptologist uh, Howard Carter, who excavated King Tut's tomb. And King's Mill and Laura Mars's extensive Egyptian collections are on display at the Worcester Art Museum right now, um, but just until January 8th. Nearly every photograph we have of Evangeline Whipple and a monumental seven by five foot oil painting seen here on the left include her male Yorkshire Terrier, Dainty. Dainty traveled everywhere alongside Evangeline, and if my theory is correct, she's holding him at the base of the Sphinx in Egypt in the photo on the right. Evangeline Whipple was devoted to her animals. In her Italian will, she ensured that her Yorkshire Terriers, Peter and Paul, and the Whippets, Duke and Prince, would be placed with caretakers who would provide for them after her death. 
In 1889, a 33-year-old Evangeline and her family traveled to Central Florida to the Pine Crest Inn. Rose Cleveland, then 43 years old, was also a guest at the resort. That initial meeting sparked a lifelong romance and decades of correspondence between Rose and Evangeline. Rose's letters are now in the collections of the Minnesota Historical Society, but Evangeline's letters to Rose have not been found yet. The letters document Rose and Evangeline's travels around the US and abroad, a network of women in their social circles, political events, and the ups and downs of being in love. Mail delivery happened twice a day then, and the first letter in the collection demonstrates Rose's persistent and longstanding demands upon Evangeline. Quote, Eva, do you know in what distress I was? No word from you at all since you had my letter written after receipt of your telegram and in anticipation of what your letter it promised should contain. By April 23rd, things were getting passionate and committed with Rose writing, quote, you are mine by every sign in earth and heaven, by every sign in soul and spirit and body, and you cannot escape me, end quote. For another six years, the love letters continued. Henry Whipple was the first Episcopalian Bishop of Minnesota, best known as an advocate for native people. He spent winters in Florida for health reasons. Henry was widowed in 1890 and in 1895, he became part of Rose and Evangeline's circle and started perhaps a little covertly courting Evangeline. Rose's letters to Evangeline from 1896 indicate that a split was imminent. On April 25th, she wrote, quote, what is yet for us I cannot see, but I think that you will need me yet in a future perhaps. I do not think that you need me now, but I plead that you will consider what I said this morning. I will give up all for you if you will try once more to be satisfied with me. In a move that surprised their family and friends, but probably not Rose Cleveland, Evangeline quietly married the 74-year-old Henry Benjamin Whipple in 1896 when she was 40 years old and moved to Minnesota. After Evangeline's wedding, Rose planned a trip with Evelyn Ames, a friend of both Rose and Evangeline's from Massachusetts. They sailed out of New York in 1896, visiting Europe and the Middle East before returning to the United States in 1899. By 1898, Rose's melancholy seems to have disappeared. She sent shorter kind of wish you were here missives in postcards, but in tone that she wasn't suffering and perhaps was having some fun. Meanwhile, Evangeline was nesting in Minnesota, devoting her life to Bishop Whipple and volunteering with the Cathedral of Our Merciful Savior, Bishop Whipple's church in Faribault, Minnesota. Evangeline developed close relationships and friendships with Dakota and Anishinaabe people living in Minnesota. She deployed her fortune to support the bishop's programs, including women's education and cottage industries like lace making in native communities. Though viewed as progressive at the time, we understand that these colonialist programs of education and acculturation caused harm to indigenous peoples and culture. Henry Whipple died in 1901. He was 79 years old. Evangeline is shown here wearing her widow's cap, a sign of mourning that she kept up for many years. Rose wrote an unusual sympathy letter to Evangeline, um, shown here on the screen, um, saying that the coming days will be, quote, among the most joyous days of your life. Despite Rose's constant calls to join her on the East Coast, Evangeline remained in Minnesota for nine years after the death of Bishop Whipple, living there a total of 14 years when realistically, with her fortune, she could have lived anywhere in the world. She continued her church work and maintained close relationships with Native people, including Sarah Goodthunder from the Dakota tribe, who, like other friends, gifted Evangeline items that she made. 
I curated the Whipple Collection of American Indian Art in Minnesota, which was my introduction to Evangeline Whipple back in 2014, oh, sorry, 2004. By 1902, at the age of 56, Rose had begun numerous business adventures, including a farm on 700 acre island off the coast of Islesboro, Maine, which she co-owned and managed with Evelyn Ames, her travel companion. Rose and Evelyn first visited Islesboro in 1898. For the East Coast elite, it was an undiscovered haven. Rose and Evelyn eventually owned two houses and about 220 acres of farmland on the island where they grew buckwheat, corn, giant pumpkins and hay, raised cows, sheep, and about 800 chickens. Considering Rose's scholarly past and Evelyn Ames's status as a Boston socialite, this turn toward living on the land is a curious one. In 1905, a newspaper article hailed Rose as the mastermind behind the creation of a summer resort and the queen of 700 Acre Island. The papers reported she had purchased land on the island, quote, about 20 years ago and paid $4,500. Since then, Miss Cleveland has sold house lots enough on the island to yield her a sum which has been estimated as high as $200,000 and she has acres and acres still yet to sell to those who will accept her terms, end quote. And for reference, in 1905, $200,000 was equal to about $5 million today. Aging deepened Rose's desire to be with Evangeline and her fear of regret if they stayed apart. In 1909, she wrote, I need you and life is not long enough to always wait. By October of 1909, Rose and Evangeline seemed to have reached an agreement after Evangeline visited 700 Acre Island with Rose noting, quote, you have warmed and blessed me as I go to sleep, I am sure and loving you as never before in all time and for all time. In 1910, Kingsmill Mars was very ill in Florence, Italy, where he was living with his wife, Laura. Evangeline left her home in Minnesota to help her brother with Rose springing into action, brokering the overseas trip. Together, she and Evangeline sailed to Italy, never to return to the United States. From that day forward, Rose and Evangeline were united until death parted them. And at this point, Rose's letters to Evangeline stop, but the story continues. Kingsville died in 1912 and Evangeline and Rose moved to Bagna de Luca, a small mountain village north of Florence, where English speaking writers like Lord Byron, Mary and Percy Shelley and Elizabeth and Robert Browning had lived a generation earlier. Evangeline eventually owned three adjacent homes in Bagni de Luca, creating a small compound that supported a circle of women. Nellie Erickson, an English artist and writer, joined Rose and Evangeline in Bagni de Luca in 1914. Like Rose and Evelyn's efforts on 700 Acre Island, perhaps the compounds were an attempt to create utopian societies. But their planned society was interrupted when Italy joined World War I in 1915. Instead of trying to leave the danger, Rose and Evangeline petitioned the consulate for new passports to allow them to stay in Europe. Rose, Evangeline, and Nellie eventually became involved in the Red Cross, working on projects in England, Belgium, and Italy. They set up workshops for local women to make clothing and supplies for soldiers, but eventually their time was consumed with a hospital they created for the Spanish influenza pandemic. And the photo on the right was taken um, at Casa Bernardini, which was one of Evangeline's homes. After the Battle of Caporetto in the fall of 1917, refugees flooded into Italy. Bagni de Luca, a town of about 2,000 people, took in 1,000 refugees. 
Relying on her missionary experiences from Minnesota, Evangeline organized housing, food, and education facilities for the refugees. Nellie Erickson caught the Spanish influenza from nursing refugees and died on November 15, 1918 at 55 years old. Rose became infected from nursing Nellie and died on November 22 at the age of 72. Within one week, Evangeline had lost her entire world and she was just 61 years old. Evangeline buried both Nellie and Rose in the English cemetery in Bagne de Luca. When Evangeline died in 1930, her will instructed that she be interned next to Rose with an identical headstone. The graves of the three women, along with other English and American travelers to Bagne de Luca, have degraded over time. Starting in 2012, and with the assistance of the Cathedral of Our Merciful Savior in Faribault, Minnesota, Evangeline's former home, the graves of Evangeline Rose and Nellie were shored up and the headstones conserved. This kicked off a restoration of the entire cemetery with four to 10 headstones and graves repaired each year. Precious and Adored concludes with a letter Evangeline wrote in 1918 to her stepdaughter, Jenny Whipple Scandron. In it, Evangeline described Rose as her precious and adored lifelong friend, and of Rose's death, she said, the light has gone out for me, but the work is too important for me to run away from, and the loss is a blow that I shall not recover from. Just as she remained in Minnesota after the death of Bishop Whipple, Evangeline continued to live in Bani de Luca after Rose's death, serving the community for 12 years. When Evangeline died in London in 1930, at the age of 74, she was brought back to Bagne de Luca and buried next to Rose as she asked with that identical marker. Those of us in the history business hang out with a lot of dead people and often their lives affect our own in unex unexpected ways. I often joke that in 2011, while I was living in Italy, Rose and Evangeline were haunting the back seat of my rental car, as this message that you see, rear passenger seatbelt not fastened, showed up on my car when I left Bagne de Luca and remained there for my two months stay. For years, Rose and Evangeline have been patiently waiting for me to finish a biography on Evangeline. So when my co-author of Precious and Adored, Lizzie Ehrenholt, contacted me and suggested the letters warranted their own book. It seemed like the perfect opportunity to dispel some of the myths and gossip that have surrounded Rose and Evangeline's relationship and the letters. Similar to Rose's communications with Evangeline, Lizzie and I wrote this book by corresponding over email. In fact, we never met face to face until the book was finished. And to me, this demonstrates the power of words and of these letters. When Evangeline sailed to Italy in 1910, she fully expected to return to Minnesota. After her death, the contents of her house were split up and liquidified and Rose's letters came into the possession of the Whipple family who donated them with a collection of family papers to the Minnesota Historical Society in 1969. When staff began arranging and describing the collection, they discovered Rose's letters. The librarians decided that since the correspondence suggested that, quote, a lesbian relationship existed between the two women, end quote, they moved a portion, a portion of Rose's letters into a separate box, sealed it, and closed it to the public for 10 years until 1980. Two years shy of the deadline, historian Jonathan Ned Katz received a tip from the Gay and Lesbian Task Force of the American Library Association about the censorship of Rose's letters. Eventually, in response to, Katz, to Katz's inquiries, the Minnesota Historical Society quietly unsealed the letters and interfiled them with the rest of the collection. So why were Rose's letters to Evangeline so controversial? The letters are unique for their time period. 
and are invaluable as evidence of same-sex sexuality in the late Victorian period. Though the explicitness of Rosa's letters are unique, the relationship that they document, that between two women, is not. In the early 1800s, women were encouraged to bond with other women in romantic friendships, often in preparation for marriage, and especially at women's colleges. Letters written by Rose and Evangeline's contemporaries, and there were many of them, detailed similar long-term romantic friend relationships between the women. In South Berwick, Maine, Sarah Orne Jewett lived with Boston writer and publisher Annie Adams Fields from 1881 until Jewett's death in 1909. Fields published the book Letters of Sarah Orne Jewett in 1911, but personal passages were heavily edited out. It's important to note that archives preserved the papers of these particular women because of their relative wealth and influence. Letters written by less privileged women who had similar relationships have not been made available through archives or even saved in the first place. Women who did not write at all, moreover, often remain invisible in the historical record. Partnerships of economic and social convenience between women were coined Boston marriages after Henry James's novel, The Bostonians from 1888. His inspiration for the characters in the novel were rumored to be Sarah Orne Jewett and Annie Fields. This designation of a Boston marriage design, denies women the same sex relationships and a sexual existence and is not an accurate description for Orne Jewett and Fields or for Rose Cleveland and Evangeline Whipple, whose wealth allowed them the choice of living together rather than an economic um, means. It's tempting given this evidence to think of Rose and Evangeline as queer, lesbian, or bisexual. In fact, I've been referring to them queer in this entire um, presentation. But this kind of labeling is anachronistic because the concept of sexual orientation was new in the 1890s. Most of the people who are beginning to think of desire as a basis for identity were doctors, mostly those specializing in the new science of psychology at that time. Rose and Evangeline wouldn't have known about the words bisexual, homosexual, or even heterosexual when they fell in love in 1890. The first English language study of homosexuality by Havelock Ellis was published in 1897. So labeling Rose and Evangeline as queer forces them to fit inside of a framework that was not their own. However, it's still possible and important to study their letters and their relationship as queer. Rose and Evangeline are the predecessors of people who are today labeled or call themselves gay, bisexual, and queer. Rose and Evangeline's very existence and the story of their love combats the idea that same-sex love is a contemporary construct. Rose's letters to Evangeline were coincidentally donated to the Minnesota Historical Society in 1969 the same year as the Stonewall riots, and ironically, during a time of queer resistance, oh, sorry, uh, queer um, flourishing, um, Rose's letters were sealed in the archives. Rose's love letters were a casualty of a cycle that has erased all kinds of queer stories from the historical record. Erasure starts when a climate of fear makes it appear risky for archives or museums to publicize or even collect queer material. In response, the keepers of the collections exclude this material. If they already own it, they don't make it discoverable for researchers. Researchers in, in turn find little evidence of queer lives in the historical record and leave them out of their writing. And then when teachers look for resources, the ones that they find lack queer content. These failed opportunities for education stoke ignorance among young people, and it adds to the culture of homophobia, which restarts the process. The reason Rose and Evangeline's correspondence survives is because of their privilege and celebrity. If Rose had not been White House hostess, would anyone have thought to save these letters? Would I have been compelled to study them? 
leading to the question, how many similar stories have been censored and erased? There are many ways that histories remain untold. Margaret Cleveland, the granddaughter of Francis and Grover Cleveland and the grandniece to Rose, was in the process of writing a biography of Francis, who preferred to be called Frank, when ALS took her life in 2021. I had the great luck of becoming friends with Margaret, who by chance lived very close to me in Maine. We coordinated several public talks together on the Cleveland First Ladies. Margaret loved learning and sharing knowledge, and it felt right to include and honor her in this presentation about her family today. And with that, um, I'm going to end the presentation and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Tilly. That was really great. So interesting and really good to hear from you about all of the research you've done uh, related to these two women and continuing to share their stories. So I have a few questions for you and um, if people in the audience who are watching with us live, please feel free to enter questions into the chat. Um, we wanted to, people were curious about the um, correspondence that um, Rose would have received. Do you have any leads on it? Do you know where it was? With so many first ladies, things seem to get destroyed or burned or thrown away and hidden. Yeah. So Rose, it, it doesn't seem to me that Rose would have um, gotten rid of the letters that Evangeline wrote to her. Um, but Evangeline was in charge of Rose's uh, property after her death. And so whether Evangeline did anything with them, we don't know. So I'm thinking that Rose probably kept them, those letters with her. Um, I, I surely would love to get my hands on them. <laughs> you know, it's just mm -hmm. um, the one thing, like a lot of people say, well, how can you know that um, it wasn't just a one way, way of relationship if you don't have those letters, right? But the one thing that Rose does for us and which is really great for historians is she quotes back things that Evangeline wrote in her letters to Evangeline. And so we do sort of have some of Evangeline's words um, filtered through Rose, but they're still there. That's really interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little more about what you learned about Rose's time as White House hostess, especially um, related to Frances Cleveland. Um, I know that it was a big surprise when her brother decided to marry um, Frankie, there was always suspected that it was going to be her mother. Um, so I'm wondering about that experience and that planning as well as her time as hostess. Yeah, so um, Rose really, you know, she said it was an inconvenience to her to be hostess, but I think she really enjoyed it. And um, she did things like kind of forced her temperance uh, uh, reality upon the White House. So, you know, they couldn't serve alcohol on any of her um, events. And um, she also, I think, brought different elements and, and really made Grover think widely about things like women's rights and um, rights for the poor and, um, and forced more social justice ideas on him. Um, regarding Frank, you know, it's that's a really complicated history for the Cle Cleveland family because, um, you know, Grover supposedly fathered a child before he came into um, office, and there was a big scandal about that. And um, the the general thinking on it is that he kind of said he was the father of um, this woman's child because all of the other men were married who might have fathered the child. And one of them was Francis Folsom's father. And um, so the family was like, you know, if we had DNA tests done, it would come back positive either way. <laughs> but um, 
Rose was kind of seen as a counter for, you know, a, a moral upstanding counter for um, Grover's kind of indiscretions. And, um, and they, the newspapers really pumped that up that she was a very moral upstanding person. And um, Rose knew by all accounts that, you know, Grover was marrying um, Francis rather than her mother. So I, I think that the newspapers really, it was like, um, you know, the paparazzi and they were just grabbing onto anything. And like I said, um, Annie Van Vechten, who's been um, potentially a romantic partner to Rose, was also in the White House a lot and everybody just thought that she was going to visit Grover. So mm -hmm. does that answer your question? <laughs> no, it, it does. That's really hopeful. Um... I, I think that you did a really great job of discussing um, some of the barriers that historians face when approaching uh, queer women in history. And I, I wondered if you could dig more into this issue. I, I pulled up this headline while you were talking from The Reductorist, which is the um, parody uh, site um, for, for women. And it says, historians pretty sure two women who lived and were buried together are just friends. And um, I wanted to discuss, you kind of talked a little bit about this idea of women being seen as friends, but um, especially with, with certain figures within the world of first ladies and thinking of like Eleanor Rose about there there's so much fear around approaching some of these relationships that women have had with each other um can you discuss a little more what goes into the way that you approach something like this as a historian yeah I mean I think that we need to um look critically at all of the evidence that we have. And that headline I, that you pulled up, I think is about like two um, Egyptian women mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's a statue of them holding hands uh, above their tomb. And, and yeah, I mean, how ridiculous to just say, oh, they were probably really good friends. Um, or people have suggested that they were twins. It's like, um, so it's it's really the problem of our society today that we can't get out from under ourselves to understand that there are other types of relationships that have existed, right? Um, in Native communities, there are up to like six or seven different words for gender in certain languages. And so these are things that um, we need to really open up our minds and think differently about. Um, for me, with Rose and Evangeline, First of all, the letters are explicit, right? And so they they tell us what we need to know. But beyond that, um, when Rose Cleveland died, Evangeline was her executor and um, inherited the entire estate um, in Italy. And when Evangeline put together her will, she um, sent back the family heirlooms to specific people in, in the family. So like one of the nieces got uh, a prized scarab necklace and another one got Rose's writing desk and it's got a special book that belonged to the family. And, and so these types of transactional um, uh, events, you know, show a spousal relationship. And then the fact that she decided, I mean, she, like I said, they were wealthy beyond belief. And so she could have had her body sent back to um, easily to Boston, as easily to Boston than to Italy. At that point, she was in London or to Minnesota um, to be buried next to either of her two husbands. And she chose um, to be buried next to Rose with an identical headstone. You know, I mean, I think that that really speaks um, loads to their relationship. Can you recommend any further reading related to um, these women? Besides, so there, of course. Yeah, yeah. So there was a biography written um, about Rose Cleveland a few years ago by Serpa Salinius. And um, I'm in the process, or I have been for years, of trying to write a um, biography of Evangeline Whipple because I think that she really um, deserves one. But, you know, there, the frustrating thing about 
researching women in particular is you just get bits and pieces. And a lot of what has been written about Rose and Evangeline has been uh, filtered through the men in their lives, right? And so it's filtered through Bishop Whipple for Evangeline or through Grover for Rose. And so trying to dig deeper and really find um, pertinent information is difficult. But on the flip side, if they hadn't been involved with those people, would we even know about them? So, you know, so. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, your personal experience researching uh, Rose and Evangeline, you came to this project as um, a historian uh, who didn't really dabble in this part of history. Um, your work is more related to Native artifacts and um, came to it via the Whipple collection. Can you talk a little bit about this and how has it changed your career as a historian? Yeah, so. Um, I'm actually trained as an anthropologist and an art historian, and um, so, which, I mean, there's so much crossover between the mm -hmm. fields, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, my life has really changed because of these two women, and Evangeline Whipple in particular, because, um, you know, I, it's not a project I set out to do and it's not something that really fits within my um professional work you know i'm a museum curator and um evangeline whipple just kept you know showing up and showing up and being so fascinating and you know i'd be going through the collection and um you know handwritten on those moccasins that i showed in the um in this in the show it's you know written specifically like made for Evangeline Whipple by Sarah Goodthunder, you know, and so um, she really had a presence and had a charisma that people um, were attracted to, and so you know the and the other thing about Evangeline Whipple is a lot of people had preconceived notions about her, especially in her hometown of Wayland. They just saw her as a gold digger and that she, you know, basically married this old guy and inherited all of his stuff. And, um, and when I went back there doing research and I really kind of showed them all of the incredible things that she did and um, how, you know, she really supported a lot of the philanthropy that Michael Simpson did and also started her own. And so really kind of setting the record straight about Evangeline and again, um, taking off our 20, 21st century goggles and kind of, you know, trying to figure out what was going on there. But, um, you know, I, it's not as if I've stopped doing native um, history. I definitely are, am um, continuing with that. But there are also so many main connections that um, it's also fascinating with me because I live in Maine and I'm, I'm from here. And being able to connect with Evangeline's like Massachusetts um, roots and uh, and Rose's ventures here um, at 700 Acre Island and um, and a lot of the women that they were involved with also were from this area and they collected um, the Penobscot Nation is in Maine and they collected Penobscot artifacts that are in museums in Europe so I mean it's just fascinating. Well, Tilly Lasky, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this has been a fascinating discussion and a wonderful presentation. For those of you who joined us late, we'll be sending out the recording to anyone who is registered for today's talk. And again, um, we'll send a link to connecting for um, the book, Precious and Adored, so you can also access the letters and read them. Thank you so much, Tilly, for joining us. This has been wonderful. Uh, thanks, everyone in the audience, for joining us for today's Legacy Lecture. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a great day.